we would sit in people's houses and sing the entire album, first Crosby, Stills and Nash record, right. on a couple of acoustic guitars from start to finish and wait to see what the reaction was. But we knew. We knew that we had something that was unique, that was pleasing, that was thought-provoking, that was complete. And we knew. He's an officer of the Order of the British Empire, a two-time inductee into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and a one-time member of one of the most politically active rock bands of all time, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Graham Nash is also a lifelong collector of photographs, a published photographer himself, and a renowned innovator in the world of digital photography. We met him in Jackson Brown's recording studio in Santa Monica, California. Graham, I've talked to a number of uh, musicians of, of our vintage who... who uh, a lot of them talk about the influence in their very, very early years of Elvis Presley on them. But I know that the very first 45 record that I ever bought for a buck was Buddy Holly and the Crickets doing That'll Be the Day. And I know that Buddy Holly was a, he was your hero back then, wasn't he? One of them, certainly. Yeah, yeah Buddy was, uh, Buddy's music was great. It was accessible, you know, it was reasonably simple, beautiful melodies. And um, he wasn't Elvis. He wasn't like a sexy guy shaking his ass. He was just, you know, one of us with glasses and you know, like, almost like a nerd kind of, right. Right. you know, in today's parlance. Uh, but yeah, but he was very influential on my, on my early career. He, 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 um, he took over from where Lonnie Donegan left off. Lonnie yeah. Donegan was a skiffle, a skiffle guy, player. you know, who brought skiffle to England. And that was incredibly simple to be able to do if you had an acoustic guitar and a wash, a wash tub, and, you know, and a tea chest bass, you could make music, right? That same kind of simplicity applies to Buddy's music. You know, everyone, if you knew three chords, you could probably play most Buddy Holly songs. And that was, in, that was good for us who didn't know anything. Yeah. You know, it was a good, good way to learn. You and, uh, you and Alan Clark were buddies when you were very young, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I've known Alan Clark since I was six years old. Okay. Uh, it was, you sang together when you were very young, mm -hmm. did you not? Yes. H how did you begin doing that? What, what made the two of you want to do that? Um, it wasn't a question of what we wanted to do. It was a question of what happened. Uh, we would, we would uh, be in part of the uh, school where every morning you would sing the Lord's Prayer to start everything off, you know, and uh, everyone was on the melody, of course, you know, various versions of whatever they thought <laughs> the melody was. Uh, and Alan and I could, could hit it right off, and we also started to sing in harmony. You know, and it, it, you know, it, it was just it, natural, was it? Uh, completely. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so I've been singing. I've been singing with Alan since I was six or seven years old. Yeah. So tell me about the start of the band then. Tell me about the start of the Hollies, which is I. I have to assume it's Buddy Holly that you were naming your band after. Um, so I don't think I've ever read that anywhere, but. Uh, well, that, that's certainly part of the story, yeah, and it was Christmas also, and, uh, you know, there's okay. a famous English tree called the Holly Tree, you know, which comes out for Christmas, you know, and um, Alan and I had been singing for many years, you know, uh, kind of like in the style of the Everly Brothers, just two young kids singing together, and we were pretty good. We, 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 we took off, where, you know, where we left off at school, we, we, we could sing together, you know, and then, then Skiffle came along, and then early American rock and roll, and eventually uh, a guy called Joe Abrams came up to us, me and Alan at a gig in the Bodega in Manchester in, in God, 1960 or something, and said, you know something, you need balking. And I said, <laughs> what? I need what? <laughs> what is it I need? He said, no, you need Pete Bocking. And who's Pete Bach? Okay, so you know, he's he's this friend of mine. And he, he, he's a lead, uh, lead guitar player, and he can play every solo you ever loved, every Little Richard solo, every 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 solo, all the uh, you know Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran stuff, all the Buddy Holly. So he knows them all. I said, Yeah, right. I go, he go, No, no, really, seriously. So we went to meet this Bocking, right? This Pete Bocking, completely um, not a normal musician at all. It looked like. Uh, Actually, it looked like an incredibly straight accountant, you know, already <laughs> balding at 17, you know, but, but he could play like a dream. And so the, the guy, Joe Abrams, that told me we needed a bucking was the drummer, right? And he had a friend, uh, Butch Mepham, who was a bass player. So me and Alan joined Pete Bocking and Joe Abrams and Butch Mepham and, and became the Four Tones, even though there were five of us. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and, and various lead guitar players would, would come in and out of the band. You know, uh, Derek Quinn from, from Freddie and the Dreamers and a guy called Vic Steele. And we eventually ended up um, uh, doing really our first uh, uh, gig as the Hollies at the Oasis Club in Manchester, which was originally the Two Js, changed its name to the Oasis Club, in December of 1962. And that was... Uh, we were doing like an audition to see if we could play at the club, see if we were good enough. And the compare came up, Graham Clegg, and he goes, you know, I'm about to introduce you. What do we call you? what, yeah. you know. <laughs> so we have that, you know, you know, we've got two minutes to come up with a name. And, and uh, we came up with the Hollies instantly. And he said, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the Hollies. <laughs> and we, t we did our first, you know, gig as the Hollies in December of 62. When did the writing start for you? When we realized that there was money to be made, <laughs> when we realized that, you know, to every A side, which is, uh, you know, in singles parlance, you know, there was a B side stuck to it and uh, you couldn't get away from that, you know, and somebody had to write the B side and all the B sides made it just as much money as the A side. Didn't get played as much on the air, so those kind of royalties weren't coming in, but the B side still sold as many as the A side because it stuck to it, right? Yeah. So, we, 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 and, and we always wanted to express ourselves in song, you know. Um, uh, because we had this ability to sing, and, and uh, I remember sitting uh, on a bench opposite Regent Road Baths in, in Salford, near Manchester, with Alan, and we'd just been swimming at the baths. And um, we didn't even have a gu our guitars with us because we'd been swimming, right? But we wrote this song called Hey, Just What's Wrong With Me, which was, the, I think, the first song that we ever wrote together. It ended up being on the B-side of our first single. Um, so we we know we and you know it's just like a muscle you just you just have to use it you know and if you don't use it it kind of disappears but if you keep using muscles they build yeah. they get stronger they get more definition la 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 and that's what happened yeah you were in there I mean at that point in time I remember being in in London in '68 uh, May of '68 actually I remember because that's when the riots were going on in Paris at the Sorbonne but I remember the feeling in London back then uh the the music was everything i mean it was it seemed to just it was everywhere it right? saturated everything it was it, in the air everything that, yep. that we did everything that we thought what was it like to be in the middle of that with a band that that was highly successful well you got to understand one very basic thing in the north of england and i'm, I'm sure it's the same in, in lots of uh, communities you're supposed to do what your dad did yeah. You know, if your dad was an engineer for 50 years, well, then, you know, you should be an engineer too, and then your son should be an engineer, you know, or if you were down in the mine or at the mill, you know, you're supposed to do what your dad did. And um, I never fell for that. My mother and father would never allow me to fall for that gold watch, work for someone for 50 years and get a gold watch patted on the head, and they'll get somebody cheaper and younger and stronger to take your place. I never uh, was allowed to fall for that kind of mentality. And, and so... Uh, the reason why I'm sitting here talking to you now is my mom and dad's encouragement to follow my dreams. Yeah. You know, they knew I was a decent kid. They knew that, you know, if I followed my heart, I wouldn't get into too much trouble. And they allowed me to, uh, to follow a path that I wanted rather than what you were supposed to do. Yeah. The, I was surprised to discover that a number of the songs that Crosby, Stills, and Nash made famous were songs that you had written when you were with the Hollies that didn't get recorded by the Hollies. A couple of them did. Yeah, tell me, tell me a little bit back. There, there began to be a, a little friction going on amongst the group, wasn't there? Yeah, the, the, the friction that was created uh, uh, that led to me leaving the Hollies was basically born in uh, Yugoslavia, in a town called Split. The Hollies were doing a show there, and I wrote a song um, in my lonely desperation called King Midas in Reverse. Decent song, I, I liked it, you know, uh, and we made a great record of it. It was really a, a, a psychedelic record. It, 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 you know, it started very simply with me on the bass strings of my acoustic guitar, and it ends up with a full orchestra going crazy at the end. It's a, it's, it's a crazy piece, and although it was uh, really lauded by the insiders, it wasn't a hit like the Hollies were used to. It right. only went to like. 26 instead of the top five, you know, and, you know, to anybody else, you know, being 26 on the charts would be wonderful, but for the Hollies, who were used to churning them out and going into the top 10 almost every, every record we made, uh, it, it wasn't a commercial success, and so they started to not trust my songwriting, right, 
And, that's, and I'd, I'd been to uh, Morocco in 1966 and I'd written Marrakesh Express and I'd started teaching children and I'd done Lady of the Island. You know, it's just stuff like that. And, but the Hollies um, were loath to, to follow my musical lead. Mm -hmm. And that's really when I, I started to, uh, to realize that, uh, that my time with the Hollies was coming to an end. And then came the, the fateful Dylan cover album. That they yes. wanted to do. You didn't want any part of that, did you? I didn't want any part of it, although I'm ashamed to admit that I'm, I, uh, we c did cut the first thing, which was uh, horrible to me, which is what made me not want to do it. But I did do one track of Blowing in the Wind with, with the boys. And it's, um, it, 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 it personally, it's, it's just awful. It, it's just. Uh, why didn't you? Why, why didn't you? Many <laughs> okay. Hey, woo. <laughs> Just the ladies now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And everybody <laughs> over here. Um, and, and and it just was becoming obvious that uh, that um, that I was uh, I was changing. You know, yeah. uh, I'd started to smoke dope. I, uh, you know, the Hollies were still. You know, they they weren't big drinkers, but they were. You know. Yeah five pints a night lads you know and, and I, I wasn't really in, into that and you know when you the difference between drinking alcohol and, and smoking dope in terms of uh, mental directions is enormous for me and uh, so all of these things came you know clashing together uh, you know and you have to throw in there that I that I'd uh, I'd met Joni at the Chateau Laurier and fallen madly in love with Joan who played me incredible incredible songs many of them you know an unending you know performance of brilliant songs that, that, that you know that left me kind of breathless yeah. it was like you know I mean if you hear Joni Mitchell for the first time and she plays you 15 songs that knock you on your ass it's pretty impressive right so I, kn I, I knew that I wanted to change my life and you throw into there that me coming to L.A. and meeting Joan for dinner and having David and Stephen there and first singing You Don't Have to Cry and hearing that, that insane sound that we make. Yeah. Um, it was obvious what I had to do. I yeah. had to go back and undo everything. Yeah. I had to leave my band and my marriage and my friends and my money and my bank account and all those things. I, I, but I had no choice. Once I heard me and David and Stephen sing, I had absolutely You no walked choice. away from all of that. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that significant. Yeah. I was because what I was going to ask you was it must have put a strain on your lifelong relationship with Ellen Clark, but I bet you it put a strain on a lot of other things too. A lot of other things. I mean, you know, any one of those things would be uh, not traumatic, would but would be a big deal in if you like mm -hmm. if you left your country, Absolutely. if you left your friends, yeah. if you left your marriage, if you left your band. I mean, it's it's all big stuff. But when I see what I need to do. I, I, I'm pretty fearless about it. I, I know that it sounds like a lot of things to undertake all in one week, but it was no big deal for me. Hmm. I mean, I, of course it was a big deal, but it, I, I mean, I didn't uh, agonize over the uh, decision to do it. It was very clear to me yeah. what I needed to do. Yeah. You, when you joined with those guys, I guess, as you said, once you heard the sound that you could produce, and I guess that goes back to the idea of harmonizing with Alan when you were kids, too. That, did you realize, because I have to think at the time, I remember thinking this at the time, actually, that it, it, it kind of surprised me that guys who could harmonize the way you guys did would be as successful as you were in the milieu of the time, because there was a lot of other stuff going on. Yeah, there was a lot of, of big guitar guitars, driven sure. stuff and everything. Yeah. A lot and, of Led Zeppelin, yeah, a lot of Jimmy, and you were doing this, and it worked. And we knew it would work. Yeah. We knew. The moment we finished that first album and gave it to Ahmed Erdogan, who was the president of Atlantic, we knew. It, I mean, we knew because we had proven that it would be a great. We would sit in people's houses and sing the entire album, first Crosby, Stills and Nash record, right. on a couple of acoustic guitars from start to finish and wait to see what the reaction was. But we knew. We knew that we had something that was unique, that was pleasing, that was thought-provoking, that was complete. And we knew. Yeah. Was that the beginning of you starting to get political when not, you were with those really. guys? Or were you, was it before Not that? really. I was already in that vein. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in 64, 
me and I think Alan and Tony helped me with it, uh, wrote a song called Too Many People, which we started to realize that you know, there's too, too many rats on this, un on this planet. You know, the, the, you know, there's only so much resources and there's, the rats keep getting many and many and many and many and many. Um, so not really, not really. But, but um, within the Hollies framework, I wasn't able to express any of right. those uh, 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 more strident opinions until I saw that that's what Stephen and David lived for, you know, and then I, re I went, oh, right, fantastic. That opens up a whole doorway of possibilities about songs that you can write because, as you, uh, you know, as a writer, I'm only, I'm only uh, writing about what happens to me. It's a completely selfish thing. Yes. I, I just get up in the morning and I get on with my day and I go, okay, what am I going to witness today that's going to provoke me when I'm lying in bed right in that moment right before you fall asleep? Oh, right. Oh, oh. I do a lot of thinking in that really strange gray zone there. Okay. Crosby calls it the uh, elves taking over the workshop. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I began to realize that with David and Stephen, I would have an avenue for those kind of feelings, and, and I was right. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, just as an aside here, before, before we carry on in the same vein, because you mentioned Amit Erdogan earlier, I, I read a quote from him somewhere, maybe in, in David Crosby's memoir from many years ago, <coughs> where he, ref and this is only my own curiosity, where he referred to you as Willie Nash. Yes. Okay. I can what? tell how old my friends are by, by what they call me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for many, my father was Bill, All right, right? Okay. and uh, I was Bill until I don't know, fourteen, fifteen, and then I became Willie for some reason. And uh, my oldest friends are the ones that call me Willie. Armour, before he died, of course, uh, always called me Willie. Neil calls me Willie. Joni calls me Willie. Okay. David and Stephen, have, uh, you know, I've been with me for a long, long time, and, and now I'm, I, I've, I've been Graham to them for a yeah. long, long time. But, you know. My friend Ronnie Stratton in England and, and my friend Alan McDougall, who's also passed away, always called me Willie. And you can tell how old my friends are by what they call me. <laughs> okay. I have to ask you, and I know it's been, it's been, you've talked about this zillions of times in your life, but I do have to ask you it. Uh, Woodstock. You guys, my, my understanding was you guys were, you, you were scared shitless at Woodstock. <coughs> one of us was. Okay. <laughs> okay. And which one would that be? That would be Stephen. Okay. You felt was, okay with it? Yeah, you yeah. kidding? I'd already been three years of madness with the Hollies. I'd already had screaming girls chasing you. and I've, you know, been there, done that. It wasn't a big deal to me. What was a big deal to me and, and to Crosby and to Stephen to a certain extent were the people that were standing around the back of the stage watching whether we could do this. Yes. That, you've got to understand something. As good as Woodstock was as a mythical event with a lot of good music, disregarding the, uh, the, the sound and sonic components of it, which sucked, yes. right? A lot of good music played. That was the, only the second time in history that CSNY had ever played. It was our second gig. And you had everybody who played there standing around seeing if Because they wanted to off, know right? whether Crosby, Stills and Nash yeah. could, could, could pull this off. Because don't forget, we'd release a first record, and it was uh, you know, in the charts and up the top there. And... You know, it was the album of the summer and changing people's lives, and it was in every, you walk down the street and you hear it coming out of students' uh, dormitory. It, it was a big album, and a lot of people wanted to know whether we could do that. Yeah. I would want to know whether we could do that. You didn't feel that pressure as much as... Not at all. No, I... Eh? Wow. No. Huh. You've always struck me, too, in that, I mean, as, as, the, as the group went on and splintered and came back and splintered and came back, and there were all That's of those... That's one way of looking at it. All of those... All of those uh, kind of internecine uh, pressures and so on. You always struck me, and I'm sure most people, as the more level-headed guy out of out of that group. Uh, mm -hmm. One never got the impression that you were the 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 doper that David Crosby was, or that you were that you had the temper that Stephen Stills was reputed to have, or any of that thing. Is that a fair assessment? Do you think? I, yeah, I guess so, and I guess it comes from having already done it for seven years with mm -hmm. the Hollies. You know, nothing, nothing about it was a big deal to me. And I've always been a pretty um, grounded fellow. You know, I, I, I want you to have a good time in life. Time is the only thing that we have. Time and family, that's it as far as I'm concerned. So what do you do with those two things? You've got to do the best you can. You've got to make every second count. You've got to try and, you know, bring as much joy and good feeling into the world as possible. I could easily piss you off. But I won't do it. Why? 
I start to upset myself in pissing you off. And what's the point of that? Right? There's yeah. no point. I mean, you know, my country was devastated twice in 80 years. I didn't know whether my house was going to be there tomorrow. Basic stuff. I didn't know where we were going to get the next meal from. And now look at it. Yeah. What is to complain about? You became an American citizen in what, 1978, right? Some, yeah, Somewhere 30, 40 years yeah. ago, yeah. yeah. Why, why did you make that decision? I became an American citizen because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I didn't want to throw uh, caustic remarks uh, at the people that were running the status quo here in America or criticize the country or praise the country without being a part of the country. I didn't want to be one of those people that was, you know, come over here and ma make money at shows and, you know, tell a few people about what Nixon was doing and then leave. I mean, no, not at all. I wanted to vote. I wanted to be a part of this country. This is an incredible country. I have a better opinion of America than you do. Well, you're Canadian, so <laughs> if you are American... We have good opinions of everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> if you are American, I, I have a different point of view of this country than you would because you're from here. I'm not. I'm yeah. from an entirely different culture, you know. And to, for me to witness what's going, been going on here, it's been an amazing voyage of discovery. Mm -hmm. But actually, I didn't want to be a hypocrite, and that's why I became a citizen. Yeah. Didn't want to be an off-campus agitator. I don't mind doing that. <laughs> but I wanted to be a part of yeah. this country. Yeah. Let me ask you about the photography. Uh, you started collecting early on photographs. Um, did you start taking photographs yourself at the same time as you started collecting, or did one follow the other? I have a book out of my images called Eye to Eye. Mm -hmm. One of the very first images in that book is an image I, a portrait I took of my mother when I was 10. I've been a photographer since I was 10 or okay. 11 years old. Okay. I was surprised to discover that the, the cover photograph of Neil Young's After the Gold Rush is your photograph. It's not my photograph, but I'm in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, that's right, you're in it. It's yes. a Joe Bernstein well, you're, you're, But you're not on the album. You're just... <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, I was cut out of the... I <coughs> ended up on the cutting room floor. Yeah. What happened is um, Neil and I and Joel were going for breakfast. Uh, and we were staying in, uh, in lower Manhattan. We walked around the corner. And I'm always trying to, you know, wait for Elvis to come back on the back of an elephant because he's going to come and I want my camera w when he does. I, I like to keep my camera and I like to be aware of what's going on around me. And I see this tiny, tiny old lady coming on the same side of the sidewalk as we are. And I saw Joel see her. And he then comes this way, takes a picture of Neil walking by these railings as the old lady click, right? But I'm standing here in that image. I ha and I, yeah. I don't know why, but I have a toothbrush in my pocket. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea why. Okay. But yes, I, yeah. I, I am in that picture. Yeah. But, you know, of course, Joel isolated Neil and the old lady and the, and the railings and the brick building. Yeah. And then when Neil saw that, and he'd been messing around in the dark room trying to make it look cool and rusty and, you know, you know, screwed up and stuff. And when Neil saw Joel's picture, he went, that's my cover. Yeah. I think Joel was 18, 17, 18. Wow. You auctioned off your collection, your, your private collection at one point. And my understanding from what I read was at the time at Sotheby's, it got the, it set the record for auctioning off <coughs> a private collection of photographs. What made you decide to, to auction it off? A couple of things. I used to uh, rotate the images throughout my house in an effort to, to uh, wake up my children's brains. I collect really strange images that would, would go, wow, what? Yeah, I, yeah, it's not a cat you know, playing with balls of wool. It's not kittens. <laughs> it's not sunsets. It's strange images. Okay. I'd gotten all the juice out of my images that I thought that they had to teach me. Put that with the fact that I had uh, discovered with my friend uh, Mac Holbert a new way of printing images, which became Nash Editions, which became the digital revolution. In fact, the, the first printer that Nash Editions ever used, the 3047 Iris graphics machine, is now in the Smithsonian. I know, it's amazing. Yeah, so this 
thread between my father at, with me at 10 years old turning me on to the magic of photography in, in this crude dark room, which happened to be my bedroom when I was a child, to maybe changing the history of photography in a slight way, you know, uh, as, as witnessed by the machine being in the, in the Smithsonian. It, my father would be incredibly proud of that. I would think so. You know? Well, some of the, I mean, it, talk a little bit about that. We've only got a couple of minutes here, but I, I do want you to address this. That the whole idea of the digital imaging that you got into for large format fine printing, because you guys really did, you were the cutting edge. And I don't think a, a whole lot of people are, realize that about you. It's just part of who I am, you know. <laughs> I want to push everything to the limit. I saw this machine and I looked at my friend Mac and I said, did that just happen? Did that thing that looks like a washing machine over there that's spinning, you know, a million mile an hour and then you stop it and, and this print came out of there? Did our worlds just change? They just changed, Mac said. I bought the machine. It was $124,000. I bought it immediately. Mac and I took it down with, with a couple of friends down to, uh, to where Mac was, uh, was living in the house I owned in Manhattan Beach, which became the original workshop for Nash Editions. Mm -hmm. Voided the warranty within the first 10 minutes of having the machine. <laughs> How did you really? do that? You cut back <coughs> on the, head, the printing heads or something, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, we wanted yeah. to put thicker paper, real paper, through there. You know, and it was basically a machine that was printing for the proofing industry. You know, and, and, you know, it's magazine stock. It's what in the New York Times supplement on a Sunday is printed. You know, it's, it's thin, cheap paper. You know, I want you to make sure that, you know, if we're going to uh, go to the trouble of printing the great image, it has to be on great paper. I mean, why, why else bother? So in, a, in an effort to, to get thicker paper through there, we had to cut off the print heads and move them back slightly, right? And there goes the warranty. And there goes the warranty. Yeah. Were you a little apprehensive when you did that at first? No. I mean, that's a big chunk of change. I know, but <laughs> we knew what we were doing. Yeah. They didn't think so. Iris Graphics thought we were two hippies from California. What the hell do they know about anything? Really? <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you in our last couple of minutes about you, you, you've just finished your, your autobiography. Mm hmm. Um, Again, I, I, I would suggest an indication that perhaps you didn't do as many drugs as some of your compatriots did, if you can remember enough to write your autobiography. Memory is a very interesting thing. You know, nobody knows where it's stored. Nobody knows, uh, you know, how much uh, capacity the brain has for, for storage, for, as a storage facility, but it's an amazing thing. And in, in many ways, one thing leads to the to If you remember this that happened to you as a child, and you go, oh, yeah, I remember the next week, my mother said, you know, you, you can't, it's all in there, yeah. you know. You just have to access Ma Maybe it. you have to look through the smoke and yeah. stuff, but it's all yeah. in there. Yeah. And I had a pretty good time talking. I did. Did you, so this was done, you, you did it orally? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Over what period of time? Um, probably uh, in terms of actual work, yeah. probably a few months. Yeah. But I would sit down with my friend Bob Spitz, who did the biography of the Beatles and the Bob Dylan book. Mm -hmm. um, and because he had uh, researched uh, the Beatles' early history, he knew all about the north of England and what happened after World War II and that, what did these 14, 15-year-old kids do, you know, to, you know, to get their jollies off, what, you know, and then skiffle. He already knew the whole story, right. you know, so I didn't have to explain any of that to yeah. him. So he would ask me questions and I would just talk, you know, and we ended up with these incredible stories. And he would, and he put them into... He made my words make sense. <laughs> okay. Then but uh, but uh, w w the, the one thing that I wanted with my autobiography was that I needed it to be in my voice. Yes. I needed you to think in, in reading it that I'm just sitting here talking to you. Right. Just like we're talking right now. And it's worked out that way. It's worked You're out very much that way. Yeah. I'm very happy with it. And what's it called? Right now, Wild Tales. Okay. Right now. But it may change before it comes out. Anything may change. All right. We've run out of time. Graham, thanks. Willie, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Okay. Thanks. So much fun being a musician. <laughs> <laughs>